Welcome to the school's next instalment of our VEVENT series, Resilient Leadership in Challenging Times. And thank you to our partners of the series, Commonwealth Bank, IBM, Red Hat, and ServiceNow. I'd like to firstly acknowledge the original custodians of this land. I'm coming to you from the land of the Eora people, and I pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging, for they hold the hopes, vision, and traditions of Indigenous Australia. We're delighted to sit down today with our guest speaker, Susan Lloyd Hurwitz, who's Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of MERVAC. Thank you for joining us today, Susan. Thank We've you. heard from, thank you. We have heard from a variety of leaders in the past four weeks, and they've each been with their own unique experiences in their sectors. So today is a bit of a first. We haven't heard yet from anyone that has such a diverse portfolio across office, retail and property. So for a bit of a treat today, and take this opportunity, I encourage you to submit your questions over the next 40 minutes through our Q&A box. You'll see that just down the bottom of the screen there. Our moderator will pick up on these questions here and ask them throughout the session. And speaking of moderators, we're thrilled to have David Clark with us. He'll skillfully weave us through today's session. So David is chairman of Chartered Hall, but he's also got 35 years of experience in investment, funds management, property fire, retail banking. So He's very uh, well briefed on today's session. But further to this, we're hosting a liver reunion today. So I believe that David and Susan used to work together some years ago. Um, so looking further uh, forward to hearing it, maybe we'll get a, a sneaky little story in there at the beginning, who knows. So with that, I'll hand over to you, David. We hope you enjoyed today's briefing. Thank you, Tracy. Good morning, Susan. How are you this morning? I'm really well, thank you. Great. Look, um, are you spending most of your time working at home or are you getting into the office every now and again? Uh, is, is the whole empire being controlled from, uh, from home? Uh, I'm largely at home. I, I have to go in about once every few weeks to sign documents that in this day and age, it's extraordinary that you still have to physically sign documents. Uh, but we, are, we made an early decision to send everybody who could work remotely was going to work remotely and pivoted the whole organization over a weekend to remote working. And so I'm, I'm largely, um, I'm largely uh, working right here from my spare bedroom. <laughs> Wonderful. It has actually been quite remarkable how companies have, uh, have changed and pivoted so quickly. Um, what, um, as Tracy mentioned, you've had a, a, a career in real estate going back um, over a number of different entities, and we, of course, worked together at Lend Lease a few years ago. Um, as you've looked back over your career, are there experiences that you've had along the way that have, uh, that have, I guess, uh, given you wonderful insights into how you might deal with the current crisis? It's a really good question. I've been reflecting on it over the last few days, and I think there's you can look at it from a corporate perspective and a personal perspective. So from a corporate perspective, there were things that we have done at Movac over the last five to six years that enabled us to do what we've been able to do now. So distributed leadership, for example, um, if you are a, a, a centralized command and control um, leader, you would be completely paralyzed in this environment. Uh, we already had 75% of Movac people working flexibly before the pandemic. Uh, the focus on impact and output rather than being at your desk. Uh, so a lot of ways that we worked and the culture that we built enabled the organization to pivot quickly. So those things were all helpful. And I would also say you and I were talking just before about preparing for crises. And uh, I, would, I would tell you that every time I would see a crisis simulation workshop in my diary, I would, my heart, I, would think, I do not want to go through this simulation. I, don't enjoy them. Um, and I'm so glad that we did it because while we didn't practice a pandemic, when the real crisis hit, we didn't have to stop and think about what committees to set up, what roles people would play, what's the role of the CEO, what's the role of the board. It was just all there ready to be rolled out. So I'm glad I, I worked through all of those uh, risk simulation workshops. And then from a personal point of view, I, there's no really one thing you could point to rather a cumulative development of leadership character now uh, that gives you the the principles that you want to work with when you need to make decisions with imperfect knowledge uh, with a, a scenario you've never seen before 
there is no playbook. And so I think accumulation of, of experiences um, shapes how you do respond. Yeah, that's really interesting. And um, I know what you mean about those um, continuity and crisis, um, crisis plan meetings, which is really the, but when you think about it, the role of the CEO is, is to make sure the current is going okay, but the pr primary role is, is looking into the, into the future and adapting to what you think is going to come. So in many respects, it sounds, it sounds like you were uh, remarkably well prepared. And I guess that leads to the next question, which is everyone in a crisis is really busy uh, working hard, dealing with the current issues, uh, but often the the real tricky thing is actually looking beyond the immediate crisis and and how you're actually going to deal with the unknown as uh, on the other side of this, as our prime minister says. So, how are you? Uh, I'm not asking you for to you to predict the future, but I'm just asking how do you and your team actually think about. Uh, that next stage? How do you, you just talked about how you prepared for, unwittingly perhaps, unprepared for, uh, prepared for this um, current crisis. How are you preparing for that next stage? Yeah, I think it's a very clear that uh, we've gone through different types of response over time. So over the last eight weeks that we've been working remotely, uh, there is that, that first phase of very intense health and safety, setting things up, uh, really grappling with the complete shock of the whole situation. Through to, I was, I think over the last two to three weeks, the business is operating just fine. Um, sure, financial impact, there's no question. We can talk about each sector a bit later on. Uh, but it's, there is a different operating cadence. Business is getting done. We are, uh, we are operating the business in a sort of a new normal over the last three weeks. And as part of that phase that we're now in, now we are starting to think about what does the future look like? We've actually got through our innovation program, Hatch, uh, we're doing a, a, an exercise around what consumer behaviour is going to change permanently mm -hmm. in the future and what is going to revert. And therefore, how do we need to change our, um, our offering to our customers, um, given the changing nature of of what people will want, how they will behave into the future. And so we're starting to think through that. We're doing a lot of work thinking about um, how people will use office space. That's a, a huge question that's been a, a big debate. Does it mean we'll need more space? Does it mean we'll need less space? What is the role of the office? So we're doing a lot of work um, talking to our customers about their experiences around that. Uh, so that's how we're starting to think. And to the point of being busy, um, I think sometimes in a crisis, you can take false comfort from being busy because if you're busy, you must be doing things and that's, that's, that's what you should be doing. But there is actually a real role for reflection and pause and quiet to think and to connect with people in a non-crisis way. So I, every day, for example, I call three people at Mervac who I would normally just bump into in the office. They're not in my regular meetings, so I'm not bumping into them. So I have a, a three every day, different people, I just call them. Um, and to avoid freaking them out, I say, hi, nothing important, just call and just say hi. Uh, and so the, the not trying to get false comfort from busyness, um, but creating pause for, uh, room for a pause and human interaction is very important. Just talking about the, the, the human behavior in all this, and we might, we might come back because you've, You've got a unique perspective, I think, given the number of sectors that you cover in the real estate area, uh, about how, how the, the sort of messages coming back from the users, the customers, the tenants, and, and I really appreciate any insight you've got there at that point. But just before we move there, just, just on that human behaviour, uh, we see all sorts of different behaviours uh, in during times of stress, and uh, you know, some, some fantastic and others perhaps not so great. Uh, so how do, you, how do you deal with that? And I, I imagine in any large organization, you're going to see representatives of both of those things. Um, if you, do you try to get ahead of that in terms of your leadership style? Uh, just, just, I guess you, you will have, 
I would imagine many of your people dealing with quite distraught uh, small business tenants uh, and uh, and therefore, uh, sorry, it looks as, uh, so therefore they would be under considerable stress. Yeah, that, that is true. I would say I've, I've seen more on the positive side of, of the of people's true character coming out. You do see real true character in situations like this. And I've seen more of the of the good side of, of humanity. I'll give you a, a good example. Uh, we, uh, we made the decision that we were going to, um, as an ELT, take a 20% pay cut. The next level down was going to have a reduction of um, to 80% of their hours and the rest of the organization would move to 90% of their hours. And the very, on, on the call where I was having to deliver this message to the organization, somebody typed in the Q&A, can I donate my leave to someone else who really needs it? Their partner has lost their job. I don't need my leave, can I donate it? But what a wonderful response in the moment of hearing that your pay is being cut. The first thing that people were thinking of was, how can I help somebody, somebody else? Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, a really different collaboration between government and corporate Australia has emerged from this in a way that I've never seen. And I really hope we don't lose it. Uh, the, the, I'm in a, a number of weekly meetings with uh, Treasury and planning um, and a genuine openness to ask questions and collaborate between policymakers and corporate Australia and ask, does this work? How would that land? Where are the gaps here? Uh, those questions were never asked before. And so the really wonderful openness coming through um, corporate and political Australia in this. Uh, and I think to you know, really the, the supporting people in stress, and yes, the retail team are, um, have had to deal with enormous amount of stress. We've put a lot of effort into um, providing support for them, resources. We've opened up our employee assistance platform to all of our retailers who can um, call in and talk to counsellors um, to try and support people the best we can. We tried to get ahead of the code of conduct that the real estate industry put in place um, by dealing with our retail tenants, in particular the SMEs, uh, very early on to give rent abatements, rent relief, uh, any kind of assistance that we can to help them get through to the other side. Susan, can you hear me okay? I'm... I can. Okay, great, because I just had some technical issues. Um, uh... Look, I think, uh, could you just, um, we touched on earlier, just some of the insights you're seeing from the different segments of, uh, of the property world. Um, you know, a lot of focus has clearly been on shopping centers, on small business tenants, uh, retailers, those sorts of things. But also, uh, there's another side, there's the big institutional investors, your, um, your residential side, all of those. Could you make some comments just about some of the things that you're seeing or you, 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 how you, if you're prepared to share it with us, just some of those early changes you might be thinking about in terms of behavior uh, as, as, we, um, as we slowly get back to whatever normal will look like. Yeah, sure. So let me um, quickly run past the, the different sectors and I'll start with retail because that's clearly the most um, obvious impact and a very dramatic change in the, the role of retail in an urban landscape. Now, it seems to have stabilised a little, so foot traffic is down about 60%, but it's now stable at down 60%. Now, and we're working through the many, many discussions we need to have with retailers about how we support them um, to start to open up, thinking about new ways of doing business. So for um, some really great innovative things came out of it. So for example, when, um, when there was no pasta in the supermarkets, in one of our stores, uh, one of the, the restaurant offerings uh, created a pop-up pasta store next to the supermarket to sell fresh pasta uh, because there was nothing in the supermarket. Uh, so th there are some really lovely innovative things coming out of that. Uh, I think what it really does um, highlight is the role of retail in an urban landscape. Um, that it is clearly not just where you go to buy a good. And this is something that we've been thinking about before we got into this crisis. Um, that, that shopping physically is a choice, not a necessity. And this experience has just turbocharged that, um, that thought. So the role of retail in an urban landscape is going to be completely different, I think, coming out of this, moving, moving away from um, sales to audience. 
the value of the audience that you can collect in an urban context in your retail shopping center. Uh, so, so that's that's really what how we're thinking about retail from a, an office perspective. Um, I, I would weigh into the debate on are we all going back to the office? I would say absolutely we are all going back to work from an office and we know we can operate the business like this. We, we, we're operating the business just fine, um, but people really crave the human interaction. So it's become clear that the role of the office is not doing work. The role of the office is the connection between the humans who are there. Uh, so I think uh, we, we definitely are going back to the office. We might use it differently. Uh, there's an argument to say people actually want more space than they've had in this com the compressed open plan in environment. Uh, so that will all, all change. Now we've, we're obviously helping our SME tenants in our office portfolio as well. Uh, particularly the retail tenants at the bottom of empty office buildings are really struggling. Uh, so uh, so uh, we're working through that. And then on the residential side, there's, there's two tales here. Uh, one is that we're actually making sales. Uh, one of our, um, our best sales people on the weekend did 10 sales at a particular master plan community, which is extraordinary to think about in this kind of environment. And we've pivoted the sales office to be all virtual. So it's a really interesting technology coming out of that. Uh, people are settling their, uh, their purchases. Uh, so the, the, the volume is definitely way up, way down, but there's, there is a, a cadence that is beginning to emerge about um, people, uh, people buying um, and settling their apartments and their, their houses. On the other side, uh, we've been trying to pioneer build to rent in Australia. And are you getting a funny noise, David? No. Uh, okay, it's just, just on my end. Um, so build to rent is an institutional asset class that exists in lots of places around the world, just not in Australia, where an institution like Mervac owns a apartment building, which is all leased. And the idea is that you can provide security of tenure, high amenity, high, high levels of management, uh, a secure home in a rental format. Uh, it's really important right now that that sector uh, can, uh, can emerge broadly uh, because there's going to be a whole new co cohort of people who won't be able to have a mortgage. So unemployment, as all the economists predict, get into the double digits. Uh, there's a whole load of people who need a secure home, who are a, a right, if you like, to a secure home, who won't be able to access financing for a mortgage, but could support rent. Um, so we're very, uh, we're very excited to be able to release our first, um, first built to rent portfolio, starting at Sydney Olympic Park later this year. And in lots of discussion with government about this is a sector that can support construction jobs. It doesn't require sales. It doesn't require financing. Uh, this is something that if we were as an industry and a society able to adopt, there's a whole new housing typology that can emerge out of this. Uh, so those are just some of the aspects thing around the different parts of our business. Industrial, clearly logistics, uh, um, just a phenomenal amount of demand for logistics with the very large and enduring shift towards e-commerce uh, and there's there's really no end to demand in that part of the market the uh, it's really interesting to build to rent i mean that's had a very long gestation period oh, sorry not yours but the whole concept hasn't it so i'm sure there'll be a lot of a huge amount of interest to see how you go with that because that could revolutionize our residential our whole residential market and um uh, certainly wish you well with it and uh, it's had a lot of uh, a lot of um, hurdles in its place so good good to see you getting that going just how do you think you can um, do you think that there's going to be a slowdown get you know getting projects underway in, a, in an uncertain time is clearly going to be a bit more challenging isn't it um, but from what I see there's still across the across the industry uh, a desire to do that and and particularly in the residential sector pretty important that we maintain we don't let that wealth the negative wealth impact of declining house prices to a very very low level uh, actually filter through into a broader economy I think that's uh, that's right and it's the the multiplier effect of development and construction is very well understood and there are lots of working groups around the country um, trying to feed through to government. Here are things, particularly in New South Wales, where it's no secret that the planning system is uh, 
torturously slow in New South Wales compared to, say, Victoria. Um, getting things out of where they're stuck so that they can start. Uh, for, there are many well-capitalised companies um, that can continue to with projects. There are many that won't be able to, so it's important that the ones that can um, do start projects. Uh, I read a stat the other day that you know, normally in Sydney we deliver something like 25,000 new apartments a year. By 2022, there's going to be 5,000 apartments delivered because of the fall off in approvals and, and starts. Um, and that's just an unsustainable level. And what we don't want is an undersupply of housing leading to housing price pressure, which would be a very bad outcome. Uh, so you know, so I, I do think there's, there's a, a willingness of, of companies to continue projects in a, in a bizarre way. I did a pitch the other day for um, a development opportunity in Melbourne, which is being bid out by uh, the government in Melbourne and we did this electronic pitch and uh, so we're, we're working on more new business now than I, that we have for, for many for many years. Uh, the leasing team is talking to tenants about uh, pre-commits for the next wave of office developments. Uh, as I said before, having moved through that sort of shock and awe phase to some form of operating cadence, people are starting to think about, oh, well, I'm actually going to need some office space in 2023, so better start thinking about that now. Uh, so uh, I, do, I do hold hope that uh, things will come out of the planning system that have been stuck there for many, many years in the case of New South Wales and uh, be able to provide some job stimulus. Certainly, that's, uh, if you read the headlines, you would, ex you would sense that everything has stopped or slowed down. And when you look inside companies such as yours, you can see that that's not the case. Leasing still taking place. Uh, development projects may be um, slowed and some on hold, obviously, but depending on the sector. But as you point out, industrial uh, and logistics are, um, are very strong. So it's, uh, it's, I think it would be wrong to paint the whole industry with one brush. That's uh, very, very specific circumstances to sectors and subsectors. Can I just, sorry, you, you were going to comment. No, no, I think that's exactly right. We, we, we often say that there is no Australian residential market. There are hundreds of markets and they all behave slightly differently and it's never more true than now. Yeah. Can I switch tack slightly? Um, you and uh, you and your board, uh, and I think your senior leadership team, uh, announced a few weeks ago that you were going to uh, reduce your salaries, take a pay cut, uh, and can you just? And then that's one of the few I think in the real estate sector uh, that there's been occasions of that in other industries and. Do you just want to lead us through the process and your thinking around that? Because it's, it's, it's quite an interesting, interesting uh, um, step. Yeah, certainly. And it, it, was, it was certainly a, an interesting journey that we went on in framing how we would think about it. And it really started with the, the view that as a leadership team and a board, we felt a very strong responsibility to do what we could do to help share the pain. Clearly our customers were in a world of pain and we felt very strongly that the right thing to do uh, to be what we aspire to be in a, being a force for good uh, was to make a contribution. And so early on, we didn't actually tell anybody about it. The ELT just took a 20% pay cut and uh, invited the board to join us and they did. Uh, and we, we didn't make a big song and dance about it. We were just making a contribution uh, to, um, to our organization. Uh, and then we started thinking about, well, what do we do with the rest of the organization? We started thinking about, well, do we make it on, you know, some people are super busy, so what happens to them and other people that they're, they're not as busy. And until we got to the principles of what we were trying to achieve, we couldn't make a decision. And the principles we came to were two, that we wanted to be as equitable as possible across the organisation, which meant that the senior people take more pain than the more junior people, um, and, we, uh, and we wanted to preserve as many jobs for as long as possible. And as soon as we landed on those two, I would call it job to be done, the principles, then it became really clear. So we came up with a, a three-tiered approach. The ELT took a 20% pay cut. The next level down took a 20% reduction in hours. And the next level, the rest of the organisation, no exceptions apart from construction workers, um, went to 90% of their hours. 
Um, but it was the, the pivot moment was when we got to the principles of equity and preserving jobs, then the actual implementation became really clear at that point. But it took us a little while to, to get to that. We had a few cracks at different, um, different structures, if you like, um, but using a principle-based approach really clarified what it was that we were trying to achieve. Right. That's really interesting. Um, the Property Council, of which you've um, played a, a prominent role over many years in, has had a, um, this has prompted them, I think, to have a much greater interaction with government uh, through, the, um, through the leasing code of conduct than, than previous. So that's, I assume, been quite a galvanising moment for the, for the Property Council. And do you think that, uh, given the importance of real estate to if there are the overall health of the economy in terms of construction, do you think that engagement's going to continue now that that door's been open? And I, I would imagine that would have been quite a tough few weeks as different parts of the property sector um, with different pressures had to actually come up with that code. So that would have... That would have um, I'm sure been, there must have been many difficult occasions, but it must have been, a, an, a, at the end, an occasion where it's actually forced it to come together, work cohesively with government. And are you hopeful that um, those relationships with uh, the Treasurer and the Prime Minister's Office for the Property Council and the senior property leaders are going to actually help a dialogue about how we actually get um, investment into various projects around the country going again? I think so. And you're right. Galvanising is, is one word for the, the process. It was a very tough two to three weeks working with you. As you say, um, the Property Council is a very broad church and yeah. there are members with very disparate interests, um, not just across sectors, but also uh, large corporates and, and smaller members. Uh, so it was uh, there were many, many hours uh, and, uh, and your Charter Hall CEO played a very prominent role, a very constructive role in pulling that conversation together. Um, so I think that we did get there in the end and many companies are, have gone beyond the code and gone earlier than the code in, in any event because it was the right thing to do. I'm, I am very hopeful that not just property's relationship with, with government and policymakers, um, but corporate Australia's relationship, as I was saying before, is, is, is at a new level. And I, I really hope that, that that doesn't change as we go into the future so that it's a much better way to run a country um, to have people in the room debating the issues um, in a, a non-adversarial, much higher trust environment. Uh, so, yeah, we were very relieved when the Code of Conduct was, uh, was agreed with government and uh, we, could, we could all move on. It was uh, galvanising is a good word for it. <laughs> So, Susan, I guess what I'd ask you is if you, I mean, from a personal point of view, uh, and I'm not seeking to pry into the decision, but there must have been some really difficult decisions around in, in this last uh, six weeks. Um, how, is, is there any particular one that stands out in your mind? Uh, the so the, the first decision to go early in, in remote working uh, was, uh, in, in retrospect, not, not a, I wouldn't call it a difficult decision, um, but it was, a, it was somewhat of a bold decision because we were very early on in um, calling out that we, we needed to have everybody working remotely. Um, certainly the thinking around um, jobs and pay was a, a, difficult, um, a difficult decision. Uh, but I keep coming back to if you've got the right principles and frames that guide you, even in an environment where you have highly imperfect information and there is no playbook and there is no right answer, you just need to do the best that you can do with what you've got. Uh, I have a very strong philosophy of uh, only worrying about things that I can have some kind of control or influence on, control's a weird word in this environment, I guess, um, some sort of influence on and not worrying about the rest. Um, I largely cut myself off from media um, because I don't need my, my mind cluttered uh, with apocalyptic news. Uh, so I try very hard to concentrate on here is a handful of things that I can have some 
form of influence over. I'm going to concentrate on these things and I'm going to shut out the rest because it's just noise and it's not helping me make the difficult decisions that we need to make as a team. And I would say also that uh, because we've got at Movac a, a highly distributed leadership style with a lot of autonomy into the business units, uh, that, that has enabled us to collectively make decisions because um, it doesn't rely on one or two or three people making all the decisions that need to be made every day. That's really interesting because I guess in these times when, as you say, imperfect information or lack of information, no one's got a monopoly on judgment. Uh, and that's what you're, that's what you're seeking to, uh, to apply. I, uh, as we head towards the end, just a question, uh, how are your, um, in terms of your frontline people, are they, and, and I asked this before and you may have answered it, but I dropped off. Uh, for a little while there. Um, just in terms of frontline people dealing with the the, um, uh, the small business people in your shopping centres, how are, how are they coping? And are you supporting them? How are you supporting them? So, we, so to look at our retail team, uh, we've, we've made a red team and a blue team so that people aren't constantly exposed mm -hmm. uh, to that pressure. So people are working in centres one week and then we do a deep clean and the, the opposite team comes in for the next week. Uh, we've got a lot of support that we've put in place around counselling, um, giving people support techniques around health and well-being, uh, a lot of support uh, that we're um, holding that out for our retailers and our tenants as well, not just our staff, so they can also access, um, access that. Uh, we're, uh, our, all of our managers are looking out for each other. Um, Mervac is a highly relational organisation, and so people have a natural instinct to reach out to each other to support, and that that culture is gold in this environment uh, because it's a natural tendency of, of people to want to help um, and to want to reach out to, um, to people in a very, a very human way. Um, and at the same time, we're, we're hearing the stories of stress. You're also hearing the stories of hope and the stories of innovation and the stories of gratitude um, that people are expressing back to the team. And so it is very inspiring for the team when they get a, a, an email from a, a tenant um, who's taking the time to write to say thank you. I got one the other day from a retailer who I've never met. Um, he's a small retailer in Melbourne and wrote to say that he just appreciated the communication he was getting from um, his uh, the property manager at the asset and the, the leasing deal that we put to them um, for relief was, in his words, fair and equitable. And it's just wonderful to get that feedback from, from tenants. You know, People, plenty of people unhappy, um, but there is they, uh, there are those feedback moments coming. And one of our uh, one of our, our retail executives uh, emailed me. Uh, I'd been having a, a little moan on a uh, I have a, a wine, women, and wisdom call on a Thursday afternoon. The senior women of Irvac we get together and a glass of wine, and I sang a, a little moan uh, about the, the difficulties that uh, we were going through getting to this code of conduct. And uh, one of our retail executives wrote me an email and said, people will remember who stood by them in their darkest hour. I know what side of history I want to be on. And so that sentiment is coming through loud and strong. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. And so true as well. Can we just, again, change topics a bit? Um, one of the very significant contributors to our... Um, our wealth as a nation uh, has been for many, many years immigration. And you can already start to see as we um, move uh, to various um, relaxation stages that politics is going to start coming back into uh, the realm of uh, our daily lives. And one of the issues, no doubt, with uh, increasing unemployment, uh, perhaps even a shortage of housing, is going to be the issue of immigration. Is there, do you, uh, um, do you have a particular view about, um, about whether uh, that's something that should be pursued? Um, can you see it being a polarizing debate for a start? Um, but um, any, any views from you and Murbeck? I think unfortunately it will be a polarizing debate for some time. Uh, it's clear now in eight weeks worth of hindsight that shutting um, travel down from China was a very sensible move um, and somewhat controversial at the time on behalf of the federal government. But 
uh, it was a, a very sensible move to stop importing infection into the country. Uh, and unfortunately, I think we are going to have this debate about immigration, but this is an immigrant country. We've been built on immigration um, it, it, for Australia's modern era. It is a key driver of what makes Australia um, a successful country. Um, so I don't know how that's going to play out and I don't pretend to have the answers on what the right policy is, but you are already hearing different sides of politics starting to talk about and we need to clamp down, we need less immigration, uh, which will be lower population growth and, and so forth. I, I don't know how that plays out. I hope it's not too damaging uh, as, a, uh, as a country for us to have that debate. Uh, I have taken a lot of heart from looking at how Australia has responded in comparison to uh, the societies, perhaps to pick the US as, as an example, uh, where the, the breakdown of connection in the US society, you've seen it writ large in this environment. Australia largely hasn't gone there. Um, so I, I don't know how that plays out, but this is a, a country of immigrants. I'm one myself. And uh, uh, it is important for our future that we continue to have skilled migration. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm just looking at some of the questions that have now come in from the audience. And uh, the uh, one of them is, uh, we, we touched on it before, but we didn't go to, to, to really this question. It's really a question of equity between, there's obviously loss at the moment going on and there's, it's being shared amongst um, landlords, tenants, and obviously banks as well. Uh, again, as the pressure of the immediate crisis passes, there's going to be issues, sorry, there's going to be debate about whether that's been fairly shared. Now, you know, we've already seen bank shareholders uh, with, um, with, a, with a dividend being suspended uh, enduring their bit of pain. Uh, so how do you think, do you think there's an ex equitable mix there at the moment? Uh, do you think it's... Um, uh, a little bit uh, biased towards one party or the other in that in that matrix. I think that's an unknowable question. Uh, <laughs> you know, the best that you can do with the the circumstances that you've got, and I think we're certainly you know we're very conscious about in the bit that I can have some influence over. How do we share pain between uh, between uh, senior staff and more junior staff? How do we and make sure that we're controlling our expenditure appropriately. Uh, how do, how, so how do we think about sharing the pain with, with our, our retail tenants, for example? Uh, so, so I don't have a broad societal view on that, or you know, how are we striking the right balance? There is some form of balance, clearly, um, and I, I don't see any part of the economy profiteering uh, out of this, that's for sure. That's certainly right. Um... Susan, as we sort of as we come to the the conclusion of our talk, is there and if you reflect back on the um, past, are there is there any particular actions that if you if you replayed it again in your mind, would you would you do something a bit a bit different? Uh, I think we all probably would do certain things differently. Uh, probably probably react earlier in many respects uh, to some of the messages that we we got. But in in your particular case, what would you is there anything that you you think you would change? Oh, I, 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 I'm very proud of Mervac actually through this whole experience, and I'm proud that we went early in um, withdrawing guidance, for example, from the market because it enabled us to think strategically about the long term um, without the uh, without the guidance um, pressure, if you if you like, on that. Um, getting people working remotely early on, taking early pay cuts as an ELT. So I'm happy with all of those decisions that we made. Were they perfect? No, but they're good enough, I think is how I would, how I would think about that. Now, probably thinking about how to support our retail team earlier, because the stress that built up in that team was quite considerable and it took us a little while to get the right amount of support around that team and to think about the concept of red and blue teams and so forth. So maybe a little quicker around around that. Uh, but you know, the time will tell if we've done yeah. the right things. I hope so. Um, one of the things uh, the um, during times like this, you tend to focus very much on, as you said, what you can influence 
uh, right now and what you need to do to protect your business, protect your people, protect your customers. Where does, and prior to this, uh, we were all uh, looking uh, very actively at our sustainability agendas. And therefore, uh, do, do those get pushed aside by the immediacy of this problem, do you think? Uh, do, do we go backwards a bit uh, in respect of sustainability, the enthusiasm for it, or do we keep driving on? I, I think the, we will keep driving on. I'm, for, um, I'm the, um, the chair of the Green Building Council uh, at the moment, and uh, it's a delightful organisation to be part of because it is very much a coalition of believers. And that this pandemic has showed us that we can take collective action when we need to. So the immediacy of the threat meant that people would do things that were previously unimaginable to, um, to protect themselves and their, their loved ones. Now, the threat of climate change is more remote for most people, but nonetheless, no less real for that. Um, so I, I think that the, we have proven that we can take co very strong collective action for the common good uh, when there, there is uh, a reason to do so. And people are starting to see, you know, there's fish in the canals in Venice and the air quality is improved across Asia and uh, people are starting to see what a world could look like maybe with less pollution and less air travel and all of those sorts of things. Uh, and then at the, the bottom line, it just makes good business sense. You know, if you're using less energy, it's cheaper. If you're sending less waste to landfill, it's cheaper. And um, so I don't think that's, that's going to away. Uh, so I, I don't think we're going to march backwards on sustainability. I think we've just proven to ourselves we can take very strong collective action when we want to. That's great. That's great. Good to hear. Um, a final question, um, just in terms of uh, some of the... the future aspects that you're looking at in terms of any any difference or change to your areas you're going to explore you talked about um, you talked about the um, build to rent sector uh, just in terms of and we touched on change behaviors in uh, shopping centers so what what might that mean because I think you were going to, I think what you were saying is they're going to be places rather than just for shopping Exactly. So the, that shift from necessity to choice, the shift from sales to audience, the, the role of a congregating place. Uh, just before the lockdown, we'd uh, put in place, uh, I think, called the Happy Place, which is an a, 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 a immersive, um, immersive experience that we put on the, the top of a, uh, one of our car parks at Broadway in Sydney. Uh, and the world, it's the world's most Instagrammable experience, apparently. It was around the US, sold out. Um, and we, uh, we, we were able to use the audience that we collect at Broadway um, to have something that you would never have thought of in the shopping center. No sales associated with it. It was, an, it, it was a, this immersive experience that people Instagrammed about. That's what, what it was all about. So, so I think that, uh, I don't have any answers for the future on, on all of this, but the, that's the direction of our thinking, at least in that space. Susan, that was wonderful. Great to talk to you. I might hand back now to Johnny. Thank you, David, and uh, what a, thank you for moderating a, a fabulous session. We had certainly plenty of questions uh, left uh, to, be un, un, to be answered. Uh, Susan, we have our business sentiment poll, and I'm sure you'll find the results from our listeners interesting as we ask them to complete their survey, how they're feeling, the role of the government, and how long this is taking. It's my pri privilege to propose the vote of thanks, and the final word will come back to you after the poll. But you've been wonderfully open with uh, sharing your views from leadership all the way through to how you're seeing how we're in, in developing our economy. And fundamentally, you build communities, as we heard from you today, where, where we live, where we work, where we shop. You, you may do property, but really, as you so articulately shared, communities for the future and the, the fact you're reading the community and trying to respond to our uh, pressures that we have now, whether it's an SME or all the way through to building new offices in the future, uh, you've been very, very open and we really treasure the sharing of those insights very much. Uh, you'll be pleased to see we have a great uh, feeling of innovation among our audience. This is in keeping with some of the issues that we've talked about earlier and the response of our businesses. The governments have had very good response from uh, our clients here and uh, people are looking at the six to 12 months 
schedule. So these are quite consistent with our polls and our other briefing. So Susan, we're over to you for the final word. We want to thank our partners, uh, CBA, IBM, Red Hat and ServiceNow for hosting the series. Susan, the final word, thank you. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure to, uh, to join in this conversation uh, this morning and uh, really appreciate people taking the time. And thank you, David, for, uh, for the great questions and for it's really lovely to connect up with you again. And we won't embarrass ourselves by talking about how many years ago that was that we worked together. That's right. Thank you very much, everybody.